Thanks for uh, having us here today. Uh, you may notice that we're actually the only unsafe speakers on the uh, agenda today. So uh, they've made sure to sterilize our presentation and uh, we will hopefully uh, be able to, to take some of the stuff that uh, Dale and Don talked about uh, earlier and put it into our uh, examples here. Uh, we do use Python, sorry Don, um, but there was, uh, when we started the, uh, the application, it was still 2010, so uh, some of it hasn't quite moved over yet. So just a quick intro, Steve is uh, from Jones Lang LaSalle. He's flown in from, uh, from Dallas to be with us here. Uh, I'm with iOpen Technologies. Uh, we're based in Abbotsford. It took me longer to get here than it did him, almost. <laughs> Uh, even with the new bridge, the, the uh, traffic just kind of moves, the congestion. So, um, Steve's background is in, uh, in architecture and as you'll see, a lot of what we're doing here is mapping floor plans. And uh, so it's polygons in a slightly different context. Uh, who, who are we? Uh, and iOpen Technologies has been around since uh, 2002. As I said, we're based in Abbotsford and our core focus is really as a systems integrator. We do a lot of CAD to GIS and uh, uh, more recently a lot of uh, mobile stuff. So we're playing a lot with the JSON uh, readers and writers that, uh, that Dale and Don were talking about. So Steve's gonna take over here for a bit. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, so real quick, just a little bit about Jones Lang LaSalle, the company that I work for. Uh, real, Jones Lang LaSalle is a real estate services and investment management firm. They specialize in everything from uh, capital planning to property management, facility management, uh, real, uh, uh, lease administration and transaction management, occupancy planning, move management, really anything and everything related to real estate. Um, Got over 40,000 employees worldwide operating in about 1,000 different locations across uh, 70 different com uh, countries. And uh, most of our clients uh, range anywhere from uh, local area markets um, where we were just managing a small portion of their portfolio up to managing their entire regional or, or global portfolio. Um, the application we're gonna be talking a little bit about today is our one view space application. So my role within IT um, at Jones Lang LaSalle is, is product management. Um, I'm the product owner for our OneView space management application. Um, so that means I'm responsible for overseeing the ongoing development, support, and implementation of that system. And that tool is used in the, the delivery of a couple of different services at Jones Lang LaSalle. Um, occupancy planning, which is a, a part of our business that's focused around helping organizations really optimize the utilization of space within a, a client's portfolio. And then the move management business, which is all about helping our clients manage the move activity, uh, moving people, moving departments, uh, even moving assets and equipment from one location to another. So we use this system to track a number of key occupancy metrics. Uh, we're looking at density of a building in terms of uh, square foot per seat, square foot per person. We're looking at the utilization of space, how much of the, the how many, what percentage of the seats are occupied, what percentage are vacant. Uh, we're also looking at the allocation of space to various organizations that occupy the space within those buildings. Uh, and we're using it to track all of the move activity as well. So coordinating, actually receiving requests from customers, coordinating with those customers um, about their upcoming move, uh, coordinating with service providers that are responsible for actually making the move happen. And we have a component within our tool that is focused around mapping. And when we talk about mapping, we're really talking about what's going on inside a building. So we're talking about floor plans, looking at each of the individual spaces within a floor, um, as opposed to, to really looking outside to, to, to city mapping or world mapping. One of the particular challenges that we've had with the existing mapping technology, which is MapGuide, um, is the PDF capability within that tool uh, really isn't sufficient enough for the, the, um, our customers and for our users. There are some, some issues with it in terms of the quality of the image that it produces. 
Um, and we don't really have a lot of the flexibility that we need uh, in terms of the layout of the, the information on the page itself. So uh, we reached out to Jonathan and iOpen Technologies to help us solve a particular issue related to PDF printing. And we had a series of requirements uh, for this particular tool. Um, one is it had to be able to integrate with our existing mapping system. So we didn't want to go out and purchase a new mapping system just to fix a, a particular issue with the, the, the printing functionality. We wanted to be able to use, utilize that, sort of add on additional functionality that was really going to give us the quality uh, that we needed out of the, out of the prints. Um, they needed to be able to work with a variety of different data sources. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about those data sources here in just a minute. Needed to be able to support a number of different browsers. Uh, we're primarily an Internet Explorer shop. We also support uh, other browsers like Firefox. Uh, but uh, long term, as we provide more support to those other browsers, uh, needed to ensure that any additional functionality that we're adding to the tool can support those browsers as well. Uh, obviously, one of our, our key requirements was being able to print um, high-resolution PDFs. Um, PDFs are easy to take and send to other people. We're not always printing the images that, we're, uh, that are coming out of the system. Um, but we really needed something that was going to be high-resolution that could be scaled anywhere from a letter-sized sheet of paper all the way up to, say, a 24 by 36-inch sheet of paper without any noticeable loss in, in quality. Uh, Every one of our clients has different reporting needs, so that means that the system had to be flexible enough to be able to deal with the different types of data that we're going to be overlaying on top of a floor plan. Um, we also needed to improve the legend capability. We'll show some examples of some of the issues that we had with the, the out-of-the-box legend uh, capability that shows up in the, the map guide prints. We wanted to be able to take advantage of some of the layering controls that are now available in the, the PDF viewers, so being able to turn on and off different data elements within a PDF. And then finally, being able to handle some of the complex patterns and labels that we have within our mapping system to display the information directly on the floor plan. Uh, some of the data sources that I mentioned earlier, uh, our, the foundation of our system is a SQL Server database, so all of the information that is uh, related to the space itself, the, out, the uh, organization that's signed to the space, the room number, the employee sitting in that space is all stored within the, the SQL database. We need to be able to combine that information with the DWGs and the, uh, the DWFs, so the actual architectural drawings, uh, the interior exterior walls, the furniture plans. Uh, we also needed to be able to tie that to our spatial information to be able to, t that the sort of the, the link between the actual room on the floor plan and the data within that uh, SQL database. And we also needed to have the capability to pull in uh, the, the different uh, layering uh, definitions for each of the data elements from our existing system. We didn't want to have to replicate that, those definitions specifically within the PDF function. We wanted to read from the existing mapping system and generate those uh, sort of real time. At the end of the day, we chose that the output would continue to be a PDF. Uh, our existing functionality uh, uh, exported the information out to a PDF, and that's a format that, you know, again, is easily transferred to anybody. Um, and, uh, but we wanted the flexibility to be able to offer other options at some point in the future, so being able to export perhaps to, a, say, a JPEG or a, a PNG file. So just to kind of give you a frame of reference for some of the issues that we were faced with with the out-of-the-box printing functionality, so within MapGuide, um, this is an example of a, a sample PDF from, uh, from MapGuide. Uh, a few issues here. The legend on the left-hand side is a bit disproportionate to the rest of the, uh, the drawing. Um, the floor plan itself isn't really maximizing all of the area on the floor. Um, the floor details, which is the text information you can not really see underneath the floor plan there, is information about the floor, the square footage, the address, and so on. That information is scaled with the drawing, so it's dependent on the size of the drawing. Um, and we didn't have a whole lot of control on the layout of the space itself. The, couldn't really control the, uh, the width and the vertical height of the, the legend, for example. As you kind of zoom into those different areas within the legend, uh, you can see the, it, it's uh, not the clearest image. Uh, it's somewhat difficult to read. There are elements within the legend itself that we don't need as well that, uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to suppress within the, the PDF function. So 
For example, the text themes that show up at the bottom. That text information is directly on the floor plan. Uh, you know, it's, it's self-explanatory on the floor plan. We don't need a label there to indicate that that was a layer that was turned on in the PDF. So we want to be able to suppress those. On the drawing side, image quality is, is rather poor. Uh, you can see there's a lot of jagged edges. The, the actual drawing elements themselves are pretty fuzzy. The text is completely unreadable in this example. And there are things that we could do to help improve that. Uh, you know, users could zoom into the floor plan so that they enlarge that area and makes the, uh, it appear as though the resolution's a bit better, but the reality is our users want to be able to print an entire floor and be able to view in, any information within that floor plan uh, and not have to sort of stitch multiple uh, copies of, of the image or the, uh, the PDF together. So this is what we've, we've ended up with. This is the, uh, the output of all of the work that Jonathan and his team did. Um, you can see right off the bat the, the layout of the, inf the, the PDF itself is much better. Uh, the legend is comparable in size um, to the rest of the page. The floor details that you see across the bottom, the text information there, is uh, in a static location. It's the same text height regardless of the image. It's, it's, it's independent of the floor plan itself. So we can print a 100,000 square foot floor plan. That in information at the bottom is going to remain the same as, say, a 10,000 square foot floor plan. Uh, we've got a PDF example here that we're going to zoom into here. This is an actual copy of the PDF that comes out of the, uh, the PDF printing function that uh, Jonathan and his team worked on. And you can see the quality of the image itself is far superior to what we have in the old version. Um, the drawing work is all uh, crystal clear. The text information is all crystal clear. Uh, it's done that, it works that way because the drawing itself is actually a vector uh, drawing versus a raster image. Um, so we can scale this up as much as we need to. There's no loss in quality there. The text information is true text within the PDF versus an image. So signif significant improvements in the quality of, of the image itself. Um, uh, we also, the information in our legend is now specific to what is included on the floor plan. In this case, we're showing a typical, uh, what we call a space category theme. It's a, indication of what the classification of each space is, what type of space it is. And within our space categories, we typically have between 12 and 15 different attributes uh, uh, or different uh, categories of space. In this example, you're only seeing about seven of them. That's simply because the PDF function is smart enough to know which space categories existed on that particular floor and has restricted the legend to only those seven or so values. Um, so it is all specific to, to what you print if I zoom into an area where I only have two or three space categories, then the legend's only going to show that as well. Um, it's also a much clearer image on the legend. It's all built dynamically uh, through the PDF process. One of the other requirements I mentioned earlier was the ability to uh, take advantage of the layering controls within uh, the, the PDF viewers. Um, so being able to, for example, turn on and off uh, different data elements. You might want to turn on the furniture plan might want to be able to turn off some of the text themes. I can see that a little bit better. Um, so what it's done, uh, what, what the, uh, the script has done, is take all of the individual layers that we had within the, the map guide tool and transferred those over as layers within the PDF file. So what John and his, and, and his team have really done is, is captured all of the requirements that we identified And, um, and then some. Jonathan's going to talk a lot about some of the additional features that uh, they incorporated as they developed this, this uh, functionality. So I'll hand it over to Jonathan to really go through more of the technical details of, of uh, FME Server. All right. So as was mentioned earlier, one of the challenges with writing PDFs is that there isn't a simple way to do it. Um, and we started off with a kind of prototype example back in 2010 when FME Server was just uh, getting its footing and uh, we've continued to move forward with it uh, over that time. And you'll see that uh, as we go through this, um, there, there is some uh, information that's, uh, or some of the workspaces and uh, transformers uh, kind of deal with some of those inherent uh, issues that we crashed into. 
So why did we choose FME server? Well, we reviewed all the other options out there and we did a fairly extensive uh, review and nothing else stood out. The, the key thing was the ability to print vector data. Um, everything else was throwing out raster information. Um, one of the other issues that, that was important was that we, need to be, we needed to be able to offload the processing from the, uh, the mapping servers so we can just link to it and uh, thereby allowing it to be both scalable and uh, stable. Um, as an organization, we had a, a, quite an extensive FME background and uh, JLL already used uh, quite a number of automated uh, or batch processed FME scripts to, uh, to deal with the data. And uh, as Steve mentioned, the ability to, uh, to do new and, uh, and cool things uh, going forward. So outputting to, to different attribute formats. Um, we'll have a look a, a little bit later at uh, um, some different ways of calling it. And then, of course, a, as PDF has developed, we now have the ability to add attributes within the PDF itself. So it becomes almost a self-contained database. And uh, you'll see um, I didn't quite achieve 10 transformers or less. Um, in fact, I'm nowhere close. And you can kind of see the green highlights the custom transformers. So, um, well, we're, we're well over several hundred different transformers in there. And uh, as we move through, it's kind of organized from left to right. So we start off with the, the source data. So we're, although we're pulling this from a map guide site, we're actually reading the source CAD files to generate the data. Um, one of the key features we were able to add was the ability to rotate. So we transform the data on the fly so that the users can take odd shaped floor plans and rotate them. Uh, Steve mentioned the themes. So themes include the colors, patterns, and text and then the layout. And this is, uh, PDF layouting is uh, a challenge. Um, it takes some getting used to just because it, it has some particular uh, requirements. And then ultimately the output to the, to the PDF. So the key components based on uh, what we went through here were FME server as a whole. So that we use the data streaming option, meaning the user clicks the, the button and waits and uh, eventually the, the PDF just shows up on, uh, in their browser. Uh, the, the PDF layout was really important, being able to configure where the parts go and uh, dealing with how they uh, are structured. It had to be configurable, so the user has to be able to drive the output based on information that they control. Text labeling was a huge issue. Um, they were talking about map text. Uh, there is no uh, current map text output for PDF. And uh, you'll see as we dig into some of the, the PDF uh, text labels, it, it becomes quite complex. The high resolution print and uh, legend, it, it just has to be there and it has to be uh, of a quality that it doesn't matter what, how far you zoom in or how large you print it. Although we just generally, to keep it simple, allow the users to, or recommend they print it at eight and a half by 11 for the PDF. They can send it to any document output tool. Polygon themes, so Autodesk has a wide variety of uh, very complex patterns. Uh, PDF and writing those is, uh, becomes challenging. It, it's just difficult to, to replicate those easily. And then finally, the layer control. So 
the data streaming service in our case is ex executed by choosing generate PDF. The users also have the ability or the option to download it as a zip file. Uh, most of them prefer not to use that. You can see that uh, there's a number of different parameters that they control. Um, the number of parameters that you'll see here is what gets passed from the JavaScript over to the uh, FME server. There's actually within the main workspace over 125 different user configurable parameters. Um, it, it gets complex and so we want to make sure that we have the flexibility but we don't, uh, the user doesn't need to see it. So the layout. In this case, really nice square floor, nice square building, but it doesn't uh, always turn out that way. There's a lot of strangely shaped uh, buildings and we need to be able to take that and fit it within the context of the page itself. You can see along the top there's a map title, left hand side is the legend, um, there's scale bar and uh, the map or floor plan details. We have to be able to deal with all kinds of different shapes, make them fit in there and uh, for example the triangle, the user may only want part of it. So we have to scale, um, offset and move that around within the, uh, the context of the, the page layout and without overwriting the other parts. Obviously the core or center of the, the floor layout is the most important and so that has to be uh, always taken care of first. So the PDF layouter is really uh, our custom transformer to uh, take all the different parts and start uh, pulling them into place. You'll see that uh, We do uh, end up with a Python caller here, um, but essentially we determine the rectangle, we offset it, and then we uh, place the different locations. So within here, um, we write the legend, we write the title, and then we deal with the themes to output. As Steve mentioned, the legend itself um, wasn't quite um, giving them the, uh, the output they required. You can see that this, these two values were from the same floor as he mentioned. This is context, or this part is context sensitive. So we're only seeing what is turned on in the web mapping application. So from the user perspective, they're just using the tool they've always used but when they go to output it, we add some additional intelligence. Again, adding the, the full floor plan here. And we also have the ability to do multiple themes. So certain themes are, are patterned, and so they want to be able to overlay them on top of colored themes. And I think the next one. So within the legend, we start building a custom transformer and using Python we separate the values out to generate a primary name and then which is the layer name and a secondary name which is derived from the database. All right, so text labeling, this is the web mapping application. This is what we're trying to replicate. If you're used to dealing with text within uh, um, FME, it, it doesn't have a justification. And so we need to be able to take what's on the left and move it over. So we spent uh, a fair amount of time working on the justification and uh, fortunately uh, the SAFE team came up with, uh, the SAFE support team came up with a very uh, helpful tool and we end up uh, 
stroking the text and then uh, writing it out, calculating the length, and then restroking it. Now that may sound sexy, but it really isn't as fun as it seems. Um, but it does give us the, the uh, eventual look we're looking for. Now, we also have to always keep the text horizontal. So no matter what uh, rotation we turn the building to, the text always has to be horizontal for the users. Um, this created some interesting challenges with donuts and holes and uh, just making sure that the, the space showed up. Because we also allow the user to clip, so you can see on the, uh, the left-hand side there, when they clip the, uh, the image, we need to then determine a minimum area that we label. So we want to make sure that if they clip it and it's larger or large enough to fit the label that we do, uh, for the smaller layers or smaller rooms that aren't clipped, we still allow them to uh, generate the text. They also have a bunch of custom symbols depending on the client, so things like uh, phones and locks and keys and different stuff like that. So we're, we're running in through custom font libraries and um, making sure that those show up in the correct location. Oops. So essentially in here, the key thing is that depending on what happens with the, the floor plan and uh, some of the new uh, 2013 service pack one uh, transformers I can see are already going to help me uh, improve some of these testers with the if then else's. Um, but we, we need to deal with uh, the, the holes within the donuts and so depending on what the output is we either use a center point or inside point uh, placer to get the text in the right location. Once the text is there, we join it up to the database and then deal with the offsets. So within the mapping application, the web-based tool, uh, a new line character in the database easily maps out multi-line text. In our case, we can't use a new line character. It's not recognized. So we have to use a, a, a list, explode the list, and then actually multi-line text based on that. And it started off as, okay, we'll, we'll deal with it. And then as we started dealing with some of the clients, we ended up finding that they actually, for some of the larger rooms, have 50 different employees in there. So we had to come up with a way that didn't care how many employees and uh, just would allow it to, to run through the label. And then we, uh, we justify it. so. As, as indicated, we, uh, we explode the text and then uh, we do a, a stroker, geometry replacer or text stroker and then uh, basically end up with the, the center justification and create the label. So configurability, we had to be able to take, come on, take the, the legend in the web mapping application and allow the user to control the output to the PDF. So you can see here, again, this is the, the user interface for them and we just take the parameters that they pass. Again, 100 and 125 plus. It's uh, parameters, parameters, parameters. It just goes on and on and uh, they they're all driven by uh, different values. So if the legend is turned on, then the, it, it partially enables the, the, uh, the transformer and then it will per pick the particular uh, table it needs to join to and um, move on. So you can see some of the custom transformers that we built to try and uh, cope with uh, some of the complexity, stripping it out so that it's that large main workspace isn't as complex. Um, and again, it all runs through. And you can see that, see the different uh, themes there. So 
Next uh, up is the, the polygon theming. So we're dealing with uh, things like uh, um, zigzags, waves, uh, honeycombs, bricks, all kinds of different uh, um, looking patterns. And, and we have to make sure that we replicate them as closely as we can to the, the web mapping application. Now, it uh, doesn't always work out perfectly, but it uh, is generally uh, very close. So again, in order to generate the, the patterns, we end up having to use uh, Python scripts. And you can see that we're actually looping through and adding uh, coordinates to draw our, uh, our zigzag lines or whatever it is we're drawing. <clears throat> One of the features that uh, kind of came about totally by accident was the ability to dynamically theme the, uh, the data. So the way the users had to uh, deal with the, the theming before was go through a, a particular uh, theme tool. Now they can just enable the theme mapping and uh, have it show up dynamically on the screen. So as they click it, as they choose the values here, those values are reflected and they're uh, pushed through to the PDF. So it, uh, as I was talking with Steve about this, um, actually we're thinking about stripping it out to become its own functionality because the users are finding it so helpful. Um, oops, sorry. The patterning, so depending on what exactly is happening, we're either uh, patterning it, symbolizing it, or uh, hatching it and running it through the different uh, custom transformers. And here we're dealing with uh, just running the, uh, the values in to get the hatch pattern. So we have to, because they are two totally independent uh, sets of data, the, the legend and the, uh, the floor plan have to be patterned and, and themed individually. So we end up with a um, accurate representation in a uh, vector format. So as mentioned, the, the layer output in the web mapping application gets driven through for certain um, outputs in the PDF, the layer names are controlled statically, um, but for other ones, we drive them dynamically from the database. So as Steve showed you in the PDF there, you have the total control over the output. Now one of the things we found as we went through this was that uh, although uh, for the most part the labels and names and uh, databases were uh, standardized. There was always uh, one or two per, uh, per client that seemed to just defy the rules. So we ended up creating uh, an array out of the, the values and then building an array of the array. So we ended up with a um, within the JavaScript, actually passing a, a potential name through so that we can catch any uh, var variability. And then I'm not going to pop into the, uh, uh, the PDF because we do, we're out of time. So I wanted to just open it up now for any questions you might have and if you have any. Yeah, it was uh, just on your clipping there, it was interesting, one of the images you ha actually had clipped the text. So every text character has been written out separately? Or? Uh, no, that was actually just a screen cap. Yeah, what we, uh, we calculate the minimum area of the clipped polygons and then we'll actually label them. So, yeah. Well, thank you very much.